So, uh, my slides are up, and uh, that means uh, I can start. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be the first talk of the day, and uh, I hope I can give you an overview of uh, what artists have been doing with this uh, technology. And um, I guess my, my interest, or kind of the group of people I've been mainly looking at, is the artists are playing with this technology over the past uh, three and a half years or so. And uh, I tend to start at uh, this point. So how many of you are familiar with uh, this type of imagery? A couple of people, a few people, very good. And yeah, so this came out of uh, one of the Google offices in the US in uh, 2015. And uh, it was basically an algorithm that emphasized the features in, uh, in various images. So you've got these crazy pagodas and uh, random creatures coming out of a very normal photograph. So this is an example of what happens when you put an artist called Memo Acton through this kind of deep dream algorithm. Yeah, it's working now. Yes, yeah, so you can see how the algorithm kind of finds various um, random shapes in, uh, in, 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 in memo space. And here is some other work with, uh, with Deep Dream by Mike Tiger, who is one of the uh, co-creators of the algorithm. So you can see how, kind of, uh, how, how beautiful some of these images can be. And uh, artists of photographers such as Daniel Ambrosi have uh, also been uh, incorporating Deep Dream in, in, into their work, in this case combining it with computational photography techniques. So you can still kind of see the realistic undertones of the image combined with some of the, you know, some, some of the crazy swirls. And then there was something that um, yeah, it came out a few months after Deep Dream called uh, Style Transfer, uh, which basically enabled you to change um, a photograph into the style of uh, Picasso or Monet or another artist. And I think it became popular a couple of years ago with an app called Prisma. You can download and then you know change your own photos into various styles. And um, yeah, artists such as uh, Gene Kogan have uh, played around with, uh, with style transfer, applying it to the image of Mona Lisa and making her cubist, impressionist, a pointer list, or also broadening the uh, definition of style to incorporate um, Google Maps, calligraphy, and, uh, and, and other images. And there's also um, Sophie Crespo, who has... Um, yeah, yeah, so she's an artist who tries to, I think, minimize the aspect of uh, content and kind of let her images run away more with, with a particular style that she is kind of looking at. I think in this case it's um, various um, kind of sea creatures and, and such animals. So I always like to show kind of this image or maybe some of uh, these Jean Kogan works because I know that uh, some of this kind of style transfer um, images, they became quite popular in the technical community as a way for researchers and developers to kind of make some artistic work. But of course, if you speak to the arts community, then uh, many of them could say that it is more of a pastiche or that it doesn't kind of um, develop or push artistic practice because it's just kind of replicating a style. But I think if you do broaden the definition of what a style can be, you can get some more interesting work. And uh, yeah, then came uh, something called uh, the GAN, um, yeah, which is you know, yeah, another type of, uh, I guess, neural network. 
and um, and yeah, I think it's probably one of the most uh, dominant techniques that artists currently use to create visual imagery. And um, yeah, Mario Klingerman is one of the artists I like to highlight here because he's been uh, using these techniques for a while now and every time there is you know, a new model that comes out, he plays around and tests it. And uh, this is some of his work from, I think, uh, one or two years ago. And uh, the image on the far right, the butcher's son, that recently won the Lumen Prize, so this September. And I think it was a nice kind of uh, recognition from the digital art community of uh, an artist who is, um, I think, quite technical in terms of his practice. So um, I was certainly very pleased that that happened. And uh, yeah, here is some of his uh, kind of newer work and uh, you can kind of also see how maybe the technology has improved in the past year or two. So some of these images here, they might be reminiscent of uh, kind of Francis Bacon because some of the limbs or the facial features are a bit confused and these are already kind of uh, a bit more um, realistic. And you could even get them much more realistic if you use kind of certain techniques, but of course, as an artist, um, maybe that's not uh, always what you want. And then, uh, moving on, um, there is an artist called uh, Roman Lipsky, um, who took a photograph of uh, a Los Angeles night scene, and then he painted nine versions of it, as you can see, in different colors. And then he used uh, yeah, a neural network to, yeah, he trained a neural network on his nine images and got it to kind of output some, some, some images. And then in, um, kind of after that, he also made some more works kind of based on these images, which you can see here. And then he put them again into the machine and got, this, uh, this is an output and uh, then he proceeded to make some more um, paintings based on that output. So to me, this is a very interesting example of how um, an artist from a fine art practice, so Roman Lipsky, he's been a landscape painter for the past 20 years or so, and normally he never works with technology, so it's somebody who is pretty much an outsider to this field. How he kind of thought, right, I'm kind of maybe reaching like a block in my practice, and I'd like to see how I can kind of add new inspiration or rethink my practice. So, um, so yeah, I think uh, from, from working uh, with, uh, with a machine, he has, uh, he has been given new ideas of composition and, um, and color, and you can kind of see how, um, how his style might have evolved like through, through these paintings as well. So, um, so yeah, I always find that a curious. Uh, I always find that this is a curious example of how a fine artist um, kind of almost organically incorporates the technology into his practice because ultimately his final results are paintings that he has made, but they are just you know, are very much influenced through this technology and uh, somewhat different in style. And uh, then there is the work of Anna Riddler who will, who's sitting over there, and who will actually give a talk later today. So I'm not going to talk too much about her. But um, what I really liked about Anna Riddler's work is that she watched this film called um, Fall of the House of Usher. And then uh, she made uh, a couple of 100 drawings based on, on the film. Um, and then she trained um, yeah, neural network to kind of generate images in her style, and then came, which were then put into an um, animation. And I'm sure, yeah, Anna will tell you more later. And um, there is a Russian artist called Yegor Prak, um, who recently did a project called uh, Content Aware Studies where he looked at uh, some of these kind of old, um, I don't know, marble figures that maybe had some parts of the sculpture missing. And then, uh, yeah, he used, uh, 
yeah, some machine learning techniques to figure out how you can reconstruct them. So I think he kind of he generated lots of uh, possible um, kind of variants of uh, faces, how these um, how these sculptures can look, and then he um, he three D printed them and kind of tried to add them to the. Um, to, to the sculptures that had something missing. So I think you can see on the image on the on the right that's uh, kind of one of his efforts. And um, there was also this uh, project from uh, the Tate um, a couple of years ago called uh, um, it's not really from the Tate. I mean they had this IK Prize which looked at how you can. Um, kind of promote British uh, art, um, and uh, they they invited kind of artists and technologists to come up with a project that would fulfil this aim using artificial intelligence. And uh, one of the projects they got that they actually decided to make the winner is uh, recognition by Fabrica, which uh, it's an Italian studio. And um, this project, it compares uh, contemporary photojournalism, so like the images on the left, to art from the Tate's collection, kind of using I don't know, facial recognition or kind of contextual analysis, and um, yeah, various other techniques to try and figure out how you can get similarities between the two. And uh, yeah, these are some of the images that it matched. So you had, you know, I think it's a, well, some car seat that is similar to an Henry Moore sculpture. You had uh, a person sitting in front of a laptop who is uh, similar to, uh, I don't know, a scholar. So I think it's, uh, it's quite a fun project looking at how you can make uh, connections with uh, contemporary media, also in terms of uh, how the photos are structured to art that has been made uh, a couple of centuries ago. So it's a cool project. And um, yeah, speaking of making links between places, uh, there, is, uh, there is this project by uh, Scott Kelly and Ben Falkinghorn called uh, Signs of Our Times. And uh, there are two artists from New Zealand who went to some of the um, national parks and put up this sign called People Who Like This Also Liked and there were three images of uh, kind of other national parks or um, destinations that you might want to go to and uh, yeah I find that um, yeah, quite a fun project because it obviously kind of draws on our obsession with technology even in environments where um, where, where you'd be maybe best to leave it behind and uh, it also kind of suggests how um, how linked we are to kind of all these uh, uh, shopping systems that keep recommending your stuff to buy so um, yeah they also had one where they put one out in front of the sea and one that blocks the slide so I really like this one because it's like very obvious in terms of Kind of blocking your engagement of maybe, um, yeah, blocking your enjoyment of maybe just kind of sliding down the slide because if you do that, you're gonna like bash your head into the sign. So, yeah, um, it's cool. And um, there's also, um, yeah, this work by uh, Nicolas Macri and uh, Maria Roskowska called uh, The Predictive Art Bot. And uh, this was shown at Transmediale a couple of years ago now. And uh, at the time, I really liked it because uh, to me it was uh, an example of uh, how you know, some artists can um, kind of almost subvert the traditional way machines are incorporated into artistic work. So normally it would be the human that would tell the machine what to do. But in this case, it's... Uh, in almost the other way around. So there's a bot that uh, is trained on uh, various news, and it comes out with artists with um, concepts for artworks, which can then be executed by by artists. 
and uh, this actually did happen at uh, um, Transmedia at some point. So this is an example of a concept that it could come out with, like a feminist land art piece divulging classified information about online dating, or a robotic fridge collecting oddities about uh, globalization. So you can see that it's got um, various concepts that um, are perhaps quite unusual, and uh, to me that is also quite similar in terms of what um, frequently happens in contemporary art, because particularly if you're not from that community, sometimes some of the concepts or the ways of thinking and talking can be kind of uh, very alien. So I think that predictive art bot is kind of, uh, it's very fitting there. And uh, yeah, if we, if we continue with the theme of uh, kind of humans doing what they are told uh, to do by machines, then um, I like this work by uh, Koralí Fogela, uh, who used um, you know, emotional recognition software, and I think she she tried to like map uh, how the human face works in terms of producing emotions, and um, she got um, yes yeah, a machine learning technique to. Um, to, to generate random strings of these numbers and then this human actress had to act out these strings of random numbers. And so normally if you had, if you were like angry or sad then you would have like a specific string of numbers that um, that would represent where your eyes or kind of eyebrows or something would need to move. But like in this case um, those Kind of numbers might be more random, so I think for the actress it was quite some challenge to like figure out how to uh, represent these kind of new um, AI generated types of uh, emotion. And um, yeah, there's uh, this project by uh, Julien Desuef and uh, Matt Plummer Fernandez. <coughs> That, uh, that I always quite like to show. And uh, it's, um, it's based in this world of Thingiverse, which is a community where you can um, upload designs for 3D kind of uh, products. And what they did is they created a project called Shiv Integer, which uh, mashes up some of these um, kind of designs to create um, designs like that, such as an open overlord nozzle or a plastic action car. Yeah, I still don't know where they got the car from here. But um, yeah, anyway, you can see that some of these designs are probably not the most kind of logical or practical in terms of the way they look and also in terms of their titles. Uh, because yeah, they were made by some bot. And uh, what this bot did is it kept posting the newest designs on uh, on the website, um, where which would normally also see the new updates from uh, artists and creators who wanted to kind of upload their new 3D design there. And uh, yeah, I always <laughs> like to see the reaction of the community in in this case because there were some people who were not sure if it was. Uh, or if it was just like a human that you know just had a lot of ideas and was figuring out how to communicate and um, yeah others were quite annoyed that it was uh, kind of dominating um, yeah dominating the front page and um, kind of pushing down the the work done by kind of so-called I don't know real artists or humans and uh, yet others they were just happy that the model was somehow included. So, um, yeah, in the end, they did an art show sometime at some point in the Netherlands where they 3D printed uh, some of these sculptures. And, uh, yeah, the people who were there could uh, vote whether it was art or spam. And I think art got quite a lot of votes. And uh, Maybe that is also part of the setting, right? If you if you go to an art gallery, probably you do have some artistic kind of interest or 
kind of knowledge or feeling in your head, so maybe you're more, you're more primed to call it art. But um, yeah, I, I like that they had this kind of uh, way of thinking about it. And uh, yeah, for the next few minutes, I'll tell you about some projects that are perhaps more um, critical in terms of how they see AI. And um, yeah, one of these is uh, this project by Lauren McCarthy called Lauren. And uh, what Lauren did there was um, she was kind of curious as to how some of these uh, devices like Alexa and Google Home products that kind of sit in our home and listen to um, kind of what we're saying, what we're doing, and how they kind of uh, uh, affect maybe some of the more traditional um, roles that also sometimes women can occupy um, in the home. And uh, what she decided to do was um, she wanted to kind of uh, fulfill the functions of uh, Alexa or Google Home as a human. So she found some uh, kind of some, some some volunteers who were kind of happy to let her um, maybe change the volume on their devices or switch the lights on and off in their home, which is something that um, Alexa could do, but she was kind of doing it as a human. And um, yeah, I certainly find that as an interesting way of kind of looking at how you can, um, um, yeah, how you can fulfill some of these basic uh, mechanical functions as a human. And uh, also maybe the amount of kind of surveillance or information, the amount of surveillance it, it entails or the amount of information you actually give to all these um, devices. Because ultimately I think Laura was kind of looking into people's homes to see what they were doing and then figure out what, what is uh, the time for an appropriate change. And uh, yeah, if we continue with the theme of uh, kind of surveillance and uh, how we can get away from uh, some technology, then uh, yeah, there is this work by Constant Delat, which is called uh, Dull Dream. And uh, it's uh, exactly the opposite of uh, Deep Dream, because Deep Dream emphasizes the features. So you get um, crazy uh, animals out of a normal image. But uh, his dull dream, uh, on the other hand, uh, reduces the features in an image. So everything becomes blurry, like the image on the right, or kind of this uh, Trump image. And I think there is a website called uh, dolldream.xyz where you can upload your picture and then it would also be transformed into kind of something like this. And this is kind of a way for you to try and escape some of these uh, facial recognition and identification systems. Or you could also try some of the techniques used by Adam Harvey in his project called CV Dazzle which is a couple of years old now, so uh, they may not work on current facial recognition systems, but at a certain point in time, it was certainly very curious to me that you could, if you had like two random kind of geometric shapes on your cheeks, then you would not be recognized as a face. But if you only had one, then you would still pass kind of the, uh, the, the, the recognition. Or you could also have wacky hairstyles. Uh, that would also be a way. And um, I think in his most recent uh, iterations of, uh, of that project, um, Adam Harvey created some sort of hyperface uh, mask. And uh, what this mask does is it tries to kind of um, merge uh, kind of your face with, uh, with the background. So, um, yeah, that's another technique to maybe avoid some of these uh, facial recognition algorithms. And, um, yeah, in terms of how it's um, also incorporated in some of the more kind of fine art practice, there's this work by Shin Sung Bak, Kim Young Hung, uh, where this collective of Korean artists, they asked. Um, fine art painters to paint a portrait of a person together with a facial recognition algorithm. And uh, they had to paint and make sure that the 
um, that the portrait they were painting was not recognizable as a face. Yeah, so um, it's got, like, it, it, it resulted in some paintings like that being created. And then, yeah, I think this is actually my, my final um, artistic image that I've kind of tagged along to the end um, because I'm never sure where to really put it or what to do with it. And I think that's kind of true of uh, what the rest of the community also thinks. And uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a portrait of a fictional character called Edmond de Villamy, made by the studio, um, by the Parisian art collective, Obvious, that was uh, sold at Christie's for like $430,000 dollars uh, earlier this October and uh, this certainly came as a big surprise to the community for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, technically it is kind of, uh, it, it is very poor and it's not really the best example of uh, what uh, some of the current uh, artistic community can produce in terms of um, kind of a GAN generated artwork. So it's like very blurry and um, yeah, it lacks much kind of fine tuning and um, yeah, other techniques. And the second is that um, uh, yeah, the code uh, behind some of this artwork was actually made by a different artist called uh, Robbie Barrett, which um, the the obvious studio didn't really kind of uh, acknowledge. Um, so. So yeah, it's, um, it's quite a, I guess, a controversial art piece that is now unfortunately in this AI art discussion and um, yeah, and um, yeah, I somehow ended up in, in my talk too. And if you'd like to see more examples of uh, kind of AI generated art, then uh, I did a gallery for an academic workshop last year um, called, yeah, NIPS Workshop because it's a, it's a conference on machine learning. Um, on yeah, machine learning for creativity and design, and um, yeah, there will actually be another one in the next two or three weeks. And uh, if you need to contact me, here are my details. And I don't know if there's time for one or two questions or not. If anyone's got any questions, then we can Very good, yeah, because I think there's somebody else like you're Skyping in now, right? Yes, we're, we're on time to finish, so that's really good timing. But I mean, good. you're going to be hanging around for a few Yes, indeed, of course. So.